morning, church. A uh, couple things that we want to deal with right off the bat. Uh, one that's not a big deal, but I, I just want to make sure that I communicate well and that you're understanding what's happening. Um, many of you have asked about the backdrop behind me, and you've said, is that real? Is that an actual uh, real building you're in? It's not, no. Yeah, this is a real place. I'm actually in the balcony of Fellowship Covenant Church, um, where we have our outdoor services. And um, so I just want to prove it to you. I just want to prove it to you. I'm just throwing through that ball. Yeah. Uh oh, I just hit the altar with it. Um, hopefully, nobody from Fellowship sees this video. Um, so let's, we cleared up that little thing. Uh, the second one is this. I want to give you an update on a few things. First of all, I just want to tell you that I miss, personally, I miss gathering with you. It, this is weird for me to be by myself in the balcony of a church, recording, hearing myself talk. What's even weirder is being at our house church on Sunday morning and watching myself talk. Um, and so we miss gathering. Uh, we were with our leadership team and staff this week. It's genuine, genuine missing the corporate gathering of our church, worshiping together, um, hearing the word together, praying for each other, missing the kids running around, flying around through our church as we're trying to tear it down. I mean, there's just so much we miss. At the same time, so much good stuff has happened as we have done house churches. Wanted to give you a little bit of an update. We have had conversations with the Arvada Center. And uh, this last week, we got news from the Arvada Center that for the remainder of 2020, they are unable to rent us their facility. There's a lot of things at play with that. Uh, they are switching operations. There's a new team. They're under new management in regards to the area that we rent. They have to purchase new equipment. They have to hire staff. And ultimately, the Arvada Center is feeling the effects of COVID as well. They're not able to have Christmas plays and things like that. And so they're going to be doing something different to try to bring people through their facility. And they feel bad. They really want to rent to us. And at the same time, um, we weren't surprised. And as we've seen many rental facilities, schools, uh, we are not alone as far as a church that doesn't have its own building. We are part of a number of churches across the country that are unable to meet right now in schools and in event facilities. So what is exciting is that we're prepared, we're ready. And we have been operating out of house churches uh, for the last number of months, and we will continue through the out the, throughout the end of 2020. This being said, it's, it's really important that you know that if you are not in a house church, and maybe you're not ready yet based on your job or, or your exposure uh, to be in a house church, but if you're not in one, we are coming after you because so many of us are experiencing such a great time in community. Um, talking to other churches right now, many other churches are having a difficult time connecting their people. Some churches are experiencing 30% of their church together. We are near 80% of our church meeting in house churches. And so over the next couple of weeks, we're going to try to start another house church. Um, but we're also trying to gather three more times this year as a corporate body. One, next Sunday, weather permitting outside Fellowship Covenant Church in the grass. Our birthday weekend, we're actually going to celebrate on November 15th. We're going to try to get together that day as well. More information to come. And last but not least, Christmas Eve Eve. We are going to probably, most likely, gather in this sanctuary behind me. This actual, real sanctuary behind me. And so, I just want to encourage you, uh, keep pushing in. Um, keep pushing in in, in, in continuing to gather with your house church. Don't give up the habit of gathering together. And you, we, we are already seeing transformation. I want to just encourage you to keep going and keep giving. Uh, just a quick update. We're still on track. We're okay financially, but we are, we're, we're on track to uh, lose about $5,000 a month 
right now we're behind in giving. And the reality is we're not spending any money on rent. So the beauty is, is that all the other things are being taken care of in the life of our church. So continue, just keep being faithful. We're so thankful for you. But let me pray and we'll get started because this is a great passage for us today um, in this moment in time. Let me pray. Father, thank you for gathering us. Some of us are in a living room. Uh, some of us are enjoying brunch together. Some of us are by ourselves. Uh, God, we just ask that you would knit us, unify us, um, bring us together in humility. Help us to uh, think through this passage rightly and then live it out well. We pray these things in your name. Amen. So why this letter and why now? Many of you know we're in the book uh, of Philippians, which is a letter that Paul drafted from prison to a house church 800 miles away in Philippi. It's largely a thank you note. But he's trying to encourage them. And he's trying to encourage them because of everything going on, not only in their midst, but what's going on in his life as well. Listen to these next four verses. Do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God, without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. And then I will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain. But even if I am poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I'm glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. Pa Paul does something really uh, brilliant here. He's actually do doing something kind of nerdy in the um, lit world. It's called intertextuality. He's actually taking some chunks of scripture, the story of Israel, and he's bringing them to mind and then weaving them into the story of the Philippians. It's actually pretty brilliant. In fact, he takes three direct quotes from the Old Testament. And so for the next couple of minutes, we're going to get nerdy. We're going to go back to the Old Testament. And we're going to figure out what Paul is doing. We're going to take those chunks of texts and we're going to rearrange them. And then we're going to see what Paul is actually telling the people of Philip. Philippi within this context. And so the first one, deep dive Old Testament, the first one comes out of Exodus chapter 16 and 17. And uh, we're going to pick up in the story of the people of Israel when um, they, are, um, they are coming out of the Exodus, meaning they are coming out of Egypt. They have been in slavery for 400 years um, they are the people of God. They are the sons and daughters of Abraham. Um, and, and they've been taught um, all their history that as the people of God, as the sons and daughters of Abraham, they're to be a blessing to the world. They're to be a blessing to all nations. They were actually to speak and show and demonstrate what it looked like to be the people of God. And, and God's blessing to them was not sp supposed to be kept to themselves as a bowl, but it was supposed to be a funnel uh, through Israel to the world. And so here's the, that's the background. Here's the verses we're jumping into. This is right after the Red Sea rescue, fresh off a spiritual high. Uh, the people of Israel are happy. And um, it says this in the verse, verse one and 16, the whole Israelite community set out from Elam and came to the desert of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai. On the 15th day of the second month, they had, after they had come out of Egypt, in the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. So they've just come out of Egypt. They have just been rescued. They made it out, and they are free from their, the people chasing them, trying to kill them. And they are already grumbling. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died um, by the Lord's hand in Egypt, there we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. 
but you have brought us out into the desert to starve this entire assembly to death. Okay, is, is ultimately, is that true of God? Is that God's heart for the people of Israel? No, it's not. Verse 6, so Moses and Aaron uh, said to the Israelites, In the evening you will know that it was the Lord who brought you out of Egypt. And in the morning you will see the glory of the Lord because he has heard your grumbling against him. That's the second time we've heard the word grumble. Uh, and then follow along and maybe in your house church say the word grumble out loud when we get to it. Who are we that you should grumble against us? Moses also said, you will know that it was the Lord when he gives you meat to eat in the evening and all the bread you want in the morning because he has heard your grumbling against him. Who are we? You are not grumbling against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses told Aaron, say to the entire Israelite community, come before the Lord, for he has heard your grumbling. Um, while Aaron was speaking to the whole Israelite community, they looked towards the desert, and there was the glory of the Lord appearing in the cloud. The Lord said to Moses, I have heard your grumbling, the, uh, sorry, the grumbling of the Israelites, tell them, at twilight you will eat meat, and in the morning you will be filled with bread. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God. Point being, they are marked by grumbling. How quickly it became the fact that they grumbled, right? And you fast forward just a few weeks, we get to, the story continues in Exodus 17, and it goes like this, verse one, the whole Israelite community set out from the desert of sin, traveling from place to place as the Lord commanded. They camped in Rephidim, uh, but, but there was no water for the people to drink, so they quarreled at Moses and said, give us water to drink. So we've already got grumbling, now we have quarreling. Moses replied, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you put the Lord uh, to the test? But the people were thirsty for water there, and they grumbled against Moses. They said, why did you bring us out of Egypt to make us and our children and livestock die of thirst? Then Moses cried out to the Lord, what am I supposed to do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. And so this is like the first textual building block. This is what Paul is driving at. He's basically saying the people of God back in the day... We're supposed to be a people who were to spread God's blessing uh, throughout the world. But the problem is this people, was they were marked with grumbling and quarreling. So let's go to our second piece of Old Testament. This is Deuteronomy 32. Um, this is further down line in the story of Israel. This is really at the end of their 40 days of wandering in the desert. Moses is old. Uh, the people who initially were promised the promised land are dying off or have already died off. And it's the next generation that is awaiting their chance. Um, and the entire generation before them dies off because they are grumbling and quarreling. Um, Moses, at the end of his life, he speaks over this next generation. And it's called the Song of Moses. And it begins, it goes like this, verse, uh, verse 1 of 32. It says, listen, and this is Moses talking about God. He says, listen, you heavens, I will speak. Hear, you earth, the words of my mouth. Let my teaching fall like rain and my words descend like dew, like showers on new grass, like abundant rain on tender plants. I will proclaim the, Lord, the name of the Lord. Oh, praise the greatness of our God. He is the rock. His works are perfect and all his ways are just. A faithful God who does no wrong, upright and just is he. Then Moses talks about the people of Israel. Verse five, they are corrupt and not his children. To their shame, they are a warped and crooked generation. Is this the way you repay the Lord, you foolish and unwise people? Is he not your father, your creator, who made you and formed you? Remember the days of old. Consider the generations long past. Ask your father, and he will tell you. 
your elders, and they will explain it to you. So the second piece is Israel is failing. Israel failed. They were, they failed, uh, Israel failed at her calling. So the first piece is grumbling and complaining. The second piece is uh, they are a warped and crooked generation. They have failed to be who they're supposed to be. Now, here, fast forward another thousand years. This is coming out of the book of Daniel. This is something else that Paul quotes in this small little letter passage to the Philippians. Um, the people of Israel are in exile. Uh, Daniel is there in exile with them. Um, he is dreaming of the future. He is dreaming. He is straining to look over the horizon to see what God is up to, what God is going to be bringing their way. And he talks about Yom Yahweh or the day of the Lord. And that is the day Hebrew prophets were yearning for. And, and, and they, were, they believed in a creator God who made everything, that he made people in, in the image of God and made the world good at its core. And these image bearers of God actually sinned against God. Uh, and in spite of the brokenness, God still wants to move. He's not going to abandon his creation. He still wants to move and intervene and act and change. And there was coming a day on the horizon, the Hebrew prophets believed where God was going to break back in and he was going to usher in a new creation and put everything back together and there would be no more sin and death and there would be no more cancer and and riots and and there would be no more of that stuff that the slate would be wiped clean that exile would be no more that the people would be back um, how God created them to be and this was the day of the Lord this was what the prophets called Yom Yahweh. And we're going to pick up in the second half of verse 1 of chapter 12. It goes like this. But at that time, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book, will be delivered. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will come awake. Some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. So the third building block is the story's not over. The first piece was Israel, the people of God, were marked with grumbling and arguing. Second piece is they were a failure. They actually didn't live up their, their calling. But the third piece is God's not done. It's not over. And one day in the future, God will return. God will, resurrection will happen. And, and we will shine. Those of us who follow Jesus will shine like stars. We will, we will proclaim with our existence God. And so flip back to Philippians. We did that nerdy Old Testament review, but flip back to Philippians. Verses 14 through 16 are one long run-on sentence where Paul tries to put all of this together. And he starts in verse 14, do everything without grumbling or arguing. So that's Exodus. And then in verse 15, he does something really interesting. He says, so that you may become blameless and pure Children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. So he does something interesting here. He actually flips. He actually quotes um, in a crooked and twisted warped generation. But instead of using that to define them as the people of God, he's actually saying, no, he's like, you can be blameless and pure within a generation that is warped and crooked. It's really genius. And then he quotes Daniel. He says, then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. And then he says, and then I will be able to boast on that day of Christ that I did not run and labor in vain. So there's so much to that sentence. So uh, on one level, you know, that big long sentence, okay? On one level, um, he's saying, 
don't grumble. The, the Greek word there is gongzimon, <laughs> which sounds like grumbling, right? Um, one scholar puts it like this, don't grumble, it means whispering complaints, talking in secret about someone, and making negative comments about someone. So when you talk to your boss, about your boss, no, so when, not when you talk to your boss, but maybe when you talk about your boss or when you talk about your spouse or when you uh, complain about your neighbor or your church or your, you know, what's going on in the world, whatever it is, like that's grumbling. We all know what that is. And then he says, uh, don't argue, um, no infighting. Um, this is like, this idea of like negative relationships and friction and pushing each other's buttons and driving each other crazy. Paul's saying, you know, on one level, don't grumble and argue. Last Saturday, woke up, went to the gym, and my mood quickly descended. I, I got to the gym and everything was full. I started getting kind of, I'm like, why am I at the gym on a Saturday? This is crazy. Um, it, and you know, I finally, I left, I went home. I was just grumpy, I was kicking stuff, angry. I was a little frustrated. I was a little uh, antsy. I was selfish. And Angela, you know, they just kind of had to tiptoe around me all day. Saturday night, go out to dinner. We go to a nice Italian restaurant. I'm just snapping at people, snapping at people and family. And Angela's like, what is your deal? And it was like, I needed to hear that. And the next morning I wake up and I read this line out of the gospels. It said, they marveled at the gracious words that fell out of his mouth. They're talking about Jesus. And the people marveled at the gracious words that fell out of his mouth. And I'm like, man, that is not true of me. And, and maybe it's not true of you either right now. I mean, we get all of this, um, this idea of who we're supposed to be in the New Testament, Colossians 4. It's, it's, it talks about be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Uh, make the most of every opportunity. You've probably heard this before. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt. Like, are my conversations like that? Ephesians 4 talks about don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths but only what is helpful for building people up. So, and, and so my, my, my conversation to me and you today is, is not to be fake, not to hold things in, but there's something about grumbling inside of us that ends up coming out. And um, the opposite of grumbling is, uh, is not pretending, it's actually gratitude. And this idea about doing everything without grumbling, doing everything in a sense with gratitude. And the idea here is that no matter what your season is right now, and, and you're probably like, hey, Ryan, do you know it's 2020 and it's like the worst year ever? I get it. Don't, no matter what your season is right now, maybe you're just not happy with your season of life right now. I know families, you've got a lot of young kids in our church, and they're exhausting. And you can't even wait for the day. I've had many of you come to me who are like, we can't wait till we're at your stage of life and your kids are grown and you can just do whatever you want. And I'm like, yeah, but there's other stuff. It's hard. It's still hard. Some of you are like empty nesters and some of us are like, man, we can't wait till we're empty nesters. And you're like, yeah, but it's kind of lonely. Some of you are single and you just can't wait to be married. Some of you are married and kind of wish you were single. Some of you are like, there's just places, your stage of life right now, and there's just ways to grumble. I get it. And all of that's on the surface. I mean, if we were just going to read the passages and go, hey, Paul tells us not to grumble and argue. We could take a lot from that and we could go pretty far. We could learn a lot. We could change a lot. And that's kind of on the surface. But there's something happening on the deeper part of this. There's a deeper end of this pool, right? 
And we could spend a lot of time in the shallow end talking about arguing and complaining, and yes, and that's important. But I want to encourage us to go to the deep end. On the deep end, the church stands in continuity with Israel, meaning just like the people of God, Israel were the people of God, so now is the church. You and me. And anybody who calls themselves followers of Jesus in the city, in our country, in our world, we are the people of God. We are now the ones that partner with God, partner with Jesus. Jesus did not come to start a religion or even to start the church. He actually came to finish and complete what Israel missed, how Israel failed. And we're a part of that. Jesus succeeded where Israel failed. And you, my friends, are followers of Jesus. You and I are followers of Jesus. You and I are the people of God. You and I, in the same way, we're called to partner with Jesus and put the world back together. And you and I have a second chance here to not lose the plot line. And the plot line is that we're a part of this and, and we're called to stick out. We're called to stick out. We're called to shine like stars in the universe. And that's difficult, especially right now. It's so difficult. So much frustration happening around us. And I get it, 2020, it's, it's a bitter time. It's frustrating and at the same time, we get to stick out even more and not participate in it. We're not called to participate in the warped and crooked, the, the, the arguing and the grumbling and the complaining and the fighting. We're called to stick out. We're called to bring hope and joy and light. We're called to shine like stars. This city, this country, this world, needs us to be the people of God now more than ever. And that's kind of the deeper end of the pool. So how? First, let's talk about grumbling and arguing. Let's, let's not do that. Let's be conscious of that. Where are we grumbling? Where are we arguing? Where are we frustrated? Where are we angry? And the other part of that is as you hold firmly, to the word of life. What does that mean? It doesn't mean hold firmly to the Bible. Don't clutch the Bible harder and say, I'm going to hold firmly to this. No, it's, it's the message about Jesus. Hold firmly to the message about Jesus. Not to lose the plot line. In the midst of all the narratives we're hearing today, whether they be political or racial or social or whatever it is, economic, don't lose the plot line. Hold firmly to the story of Jesus. Listen to what N.T. Wright says in his book, Simply Jesus. It's a long quote, so bear with me. He says, here then is the message of Easter, or at least the beginning of that message. The resurrection of Jesus doesn't mean it's all right. We're going to heaven now. No, the life of heaven has been born on this earth. It doesn't mean so there is a life after death. Well, there is, but Easter says much, much more than that. It speaks of a life that is neither ghostly nor unreal, but solid and definite and practical. The Easter stories come at the end of the four Gospels, but they are not about the end. They are about the beginning. The beginning of God's new world, the beginning of the kingdom. God is now in charge on earth as it is in heaven. And God's being in charge is focused on Jesus himself being the king and the Lord. The title on the cross was true after all. The resurrection proves it. Holding fast to the word of life. 
holding fast to the story of Jesus and God's work in this world, that one day Jesus will return and he will usher in a fully finished reality, one that is without cancer and wildfires and, and racism. There will be no more politics, no more school shootings, human trafficking, strip mining, no more divorce. The death and resurrection of Jesus is a message. It's a reality, okay, that can bring life into you. That can strip away all the brokenness and bring new life into you. And it's a mission for you and I to be a part of. It transforms us. And then it awakens us to do transforming. So Paul says, don't grumble and argue. Shine. And then he says, hold firmly, hold tight. And another way to translate that is hold out. So which one could be true? Hold firmly, hold tight, or hold out? Both of them. Hang on to the message of life and hold it up for the world to see because God is not done. Jesus is not done. And then let's finish up. There's two, two more verses here that are really important. Check this out. But even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. So quick background here. This is so cool. Paul does an amazing thing and he brings in the Old Testament and, and the Jewish people in the audience are like, that sounds familiar, that sounds familiar. But then he has actually a way of just drawing in also the Gentiles in the church of Philippi. And so it's true that Jewish people understood sacrifice and they understood what that looked like as far as animal sacrifice, but so did the Gentiles. So whether you were offering a sacrifice to um, to God in Jerusalem, or you were offering a sacrifice to Apollo or Zeus or Poseidon in Philippi. It would probably be an animal sacrifice. And um, if you were Roman and if you were pagan, you would do, go to the temple and offer an animal sacrifice. And then, just like the Jews would, there was a drink offering piece. It would be poured out over the offering. And here's what Paul is saying. He's saying, you are the animal sacrifice. You are the animal and I am the drink offering. And we together form a living sacrifice for the creator of the universe. Meaning we put our lives out. Romans 12, you read today in house church as a call to worship. Paul says to the people in Rome, be a living sacrifice. That your life is not about showing up at church and just being a good person. Your life is actually to be poured out as well. You and I are living sacrifices. We are, you know, he, he talks about this idea of pouring out and that's the idea that we get from Jesus just a few verses before that we are to be poured out like Jesus. Guys, we're not supposed to just acknowledge and believe. But we're actually supposed to lay our lives out. We're actually supposed to be living sacrifices. To give our lives away. And listen, that's hard. There's nothing harder than giving your life away. It truly is a sacrifice. And if you're willing to give your life away, you will find joy. Listen, we are fully aware of the times we're in. The leadership team, the staff, our teaching team, it is not an accident that we're studying this letter. It's not an accident. When we think of the future and we look at who we are as a church and what's happening in our world and where we need to go, we take what we're doing on Sundays here is very seriously because we are a community 
of people who are trying to be with Jesus, become like Jesus, and do what Jesus did. And we're called to lay ourselves down. We're called to not miss the plot line. We're called to hold firmly to the, the story of Jesus and what that means for not only you and me, but everybody else. So my questions for us are this. Are you, are you grumbling? Are you arguing? Are you complaining with God? Maybe it's with God personally. Maybe you're just frustrated. Are you grumbling about your stage of life? Are you grumbling and frustrated at God? Are you, are you angry at this season? I don't want you to lose the plot line. Don't lose it. Maybe you need to have some honest time with the Lord. Maybe you need to just confess that in your house church today. Yeah, that's me. I'm ticked. I'm frustrated. Help me. <laughs> Church, help me, house church, help me recapture the plot line in my life. I want to pray for us. Father, we take this seriously. Since we are the people of God, since you have adopted us into your family, since you have given us this purpose and this inheritance, God, Spirit, Show us, highlight where we grumble, where we complain. God, we want to stick out, not as moralists, not as like goody goodies, but we want to stick out with a sharpness, a differentiation to the world we live in. God, we want to shine like stars. We want to be a blessing. We want to pour out for this world, just like you have poured out. God, show us what that looks like. Spirit, convict us, challenge us. God, if there's work that we need to do with each other and, and reconcile, God, show us that. Bind us together. Give us unity. This is all about relationships. This is all about people. We thank you for your your son Jesus, the cross, the resurrection. God, let, help us, show us how it looks like to live as living sacrifices. We pray these things in your name. Amen.